everybody. Hi. Thank God you're awake. My name is Jeremy. I'm really excited to be here. Um, when I was your age, I, uh, I had a bad day, like a really bad day. One day it was raining outside and I woke up and I knew it would be a bad day. You know those mornings where you wake up and you're like, I'm going to skip school or I'm going to lie to my parents about being sick or I might actually be sick. Oh God, I don't want to go to school. And on that day, I decided to get up and get out of bed and have breakfast and brush my teeth and go to school. And as I walked to school, I held my umbrella and it broke and I got soaking wet. As I got into class, I sat down soaking wet, trying to dry off my coat, already running late. And my vice principal came into school and said that someone had graffitied my locker and that I had to clean it off because the custodian didn't want to touch my locker. She didn't want to catch the gay. So I had to clean it off myself. After I finished cleaning graffiti off my locker, I went to my second period to walk into my classroom only to find out that someone had taken my homework off the teacher's desk and ripped it into small pieces of paper and they threw it in my face like snow. Everyone laughed and I remember picking the pieces of paper off my face where the water was still there from the morning and peeling it off like an orange. At lunch, I went to the library to print off a new copy. I got in line at the staff lounge. I waited my turn. I handed it to my teacher. I explained to her what happened. And she smiled at me and said, homework's due at the beginning of class, not at the end. She ripped my homework in half and threw it on the floor. And I, I didn't say anything. I was wet from the rain. I was hungry because I skipped lunch to print off my homework. And I was tired. I was tired that situations like this was every day of my life. And I threw out my homework in the recycling bin, and I walked up the stairs to science class, and I walked down the hallway. And as I walked to the class, these two guys called me a fag. And I turned around to say something to them, but uh, they just turned around and high-fived each other. I can still hear them laughing as they didn't even look back. They didn't even care to see the pain that they inflicted. They just thought it was one joke, one moment. 30 seconds, they were just about to forget. And for me, I would never forget, no matter how hard I tried. And that's bullying, right? For everyone else, it's one joke, one moment, 30 seconds. And for me, it's one paper cut. And the truth is, the truth is that one paper cut doesn't matter. But a thousand that chop into your soul every single day, you fall apart from the inside out. I remember falling to the floor and trying to pick up the pieces and putting them into my pocket, only to walk into science class and our teacher put us into groups. I got put with Mike and this random girl, and Mike started making fun of me and calling me names. And I didn't say anything. No one in class said anything. My teacher didn't say anything. But I didn't say anything. I tried everything. I tried walking away. I tried fighting back. I tried telling my parents and my teachers. I tried ignoring it, and nothing ever worked. So I closed my eyes, and I gave up. And I wished I wasn't in class, and I wished I wasn't in school. And frankly, honestly, I wished I was dead. And in that moment, this girl said, stop. And I thought she was talking to the train of thought inside my head, but when I opened my eyes, she was talking to Mike. She was the first person ever to stand up for me, and it worked. We blew up our science volcano, we left class early, and I ran up to her, and I'm like, who are you? And she smiled, and she was like, I'm Jessica. And I'm like, okay, well, why'd you stand up for me? And she smiled at me, and she said, well, you seem like a nice person, which is weird, because when people call you a loser every single day of your life, you literally start to believe it. But she said one nice thing, and I felt like a human being on the inside. We became friends. We hung out. We went out for coffee, and we watched movies on weekends. And one day, when my school didn't let me go to prom with my boyfriend, she shaved her head, dressed up like a dude, and showed up with a pink Cadillac in front of my house. I hadn't even brought prom tickets. I didn't even have a suit. And she was there waiting for me, honking the horn, being like, we got 10 minutes, and you got to go. After prom was over, we all went back to Emily's house, and as we watched TV and ate ice cream, my friend Jess was like, you should do something. You should do something. And the truth is, when it comes to bullying, when it comes to oppression, when it comes to discrimination, we all need to do something. Because the research is really clear. The truth is, whether we like to believe it or not, there's three undeniable facts. Each one of us, every single person in this room, has had someone make them feel about this big. Everyone in this room has seen something bad happen and not said anything. And everyone, including myself, has done something that has hurt someone else and made someone feel this small. 
And so we need to challenge ourselves to think differently about bullying-based behaviors. But the truth is that bullying-based behaviors, when we tell a friend to just, oh, shut up, or, oh my god, that's totally ridiculous, that behavior is enshrined in who we are as Canadian people. The best way to make a friend is to look at someone else and say, hey, oh my god, I hate her shoes. And you look at that person and they're like, yeah, oh my god, that's awful. Bullying-based behaviors are folded into the fabric of our society. In fact, when I used to run on the football field, the other kids used to call me a fag, when technically I wasn't running like a fag, technically I was running like a girl, because I wasn't holding a guy's hand or making out with a guy, technically I was running in an effeminate way. Which is really interesting, because it makes that homophobic comment actually a sexist one. But it's that same sexism that teaches those same boys to punch each other, because it's better that they communicate with violence, it's better that they fist bump each other, than it is that they hug each other. Because if they hug each other, then they're fags too. And this is what we call a cycle of violence or discrimination that's folded right into the fabric of our society. The truth is, the difference between Mai and Mike is actually not that big. According to basic research uh, around bullying from the University of Kingston through the research project, project called PrevNet, Mike and I actually statistically got bullied just as much as one another. So why is it that when he got called gay, it didn't bother him? Why is it that I would hide in my teacher's office or go to uh, bed crying? Why is it that he just seemed to just have it roll off his back? Well, the truth is, when Mike got called gay, it didn't bother him because he wasn't gay. It didn't affect him because his parents were rich and he had wealth. He used to go to hockey practice, and when his parents didn't want to wake up early, they'd just send him a cab. The truth is, he had Nike shoes, and I didn't own a brand name until I was in university. The truth is, when people called him gay, it didn't bother him because he was dating the most popular girl in school. And his parents loved his girlfriend. When I got called gay, I actually wondered if people knew it was true. When I got called gay, I was scared that someone would actually find out. When I got called gay, I was afraid that my parents would know or that they'd kick me out of the house. It bothered me. It didn't roll off my back. And I didn't play sports. We didn't have Nikes. We actually didn't have a lot of things. But I made it work, and I'm very lucky that my parents were always really supportive. All of that to say, though, is that one behavior can be a joke for someone else, and another behavior, the exact same thing, can be totally detrimental to someone who's different. So how do we create a plane of equity and respect in a school where one thing is funny and one thing isn't? Well, the truth is we call it cultural literacy the understanding of different communities and the different spaces that we live in. Do you know that this year marks the 40th an 49th anniversary of the decriminalization of homosexuality? That's right, in a few months, Canada will celebrate 50 years. 50 years that we started the path towards decriminalizing homosexuality in my country. That's right, 49 years ago, if I was standing here and telling you this exact same story, I'd be arrested. It's huge, it's a landmark. It's a victory, and yet it's a part of Canada's story that we don't share with each other. And the path towards decriminalization, the path towards equal marriage, the path towards trans rights and healthcare, these are stories that are part of our culture. And I wonder, I wonder what would have happened if we had told these stories in my school, in my community. If my parents had information that the rainbow flag was created by Gilbert Baker, that each of the colors mean different magical and glittery things. What if? What if when I was told I was gay, it was actually a great thing, a celebrating thing, something worthy of cake, lots and lots of cake? The truth is, when we look at diversity in our community, we have to challenge ourselves to be what we call culturally understanding or create a sense of cultural literacy. And not all of us are immune to it. I actually went to, oof, I told myself I wouldn't do that too. Uh, I actually went to Catholic school in northern Alberta before I moved to Sault Ste. Marie, before I had that bad day. And in my Catholic school, we didn't actually learn anything about Jewish communities, Jewish culture, Jewish history, but I was on the choir. And one day we were singing at City Hall in downtown Edmonton, and we found out that the Jewish choir was there. And we made fun of them. It was awful. It was embarrassing. I look back on that moment and I feel like a terrible person. And when we came back to school, we all got suspended for a week. When we came back the next week, me and my friends kept on making stupid and inappropriate jokes. And about two weeks later, my friend Hannah in class in science turned around and said, you have to stop. And we said, why? 
Jewish people are over there, they're not over here. And she actually looked at us in our Catholic school and said, I'm Jewish. And we're like, what? And she's like, it's got a good French immersion program and the school's a block away from my house. Over the next few weeks, her parents came over to school and they taught us about Shabbos and how to make challah bread. They taught me that Hanukkah isn't actually a thing. It's actually about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And that cultural literacy made me able to be more supportive of Jewish communities. It made me challenge the discriminations that I face towards Jewish people. Similarly, I think straight people, cisgender people, need to challenge the way they treat LGBTQ people. And the solution isn't just to stop being mean. The solution is to create a fabric of inclusion in our communities, to put up rainbow flags and then go beyond that, to celebrate next year's great 50th anniversary. What are you gonna do to recognize that Canada is reaching this major milestone? And how are you gonna imagine creating trans healthcare in our country? And how are you gonna imagine creating intersex solutions for queer and trans folk who are still struggling in our country? The truth is, we have so much work to do. But what's really exciting is that we're at a space where we can all do it together. Thank you.